stating right now that I'm not an education expert. To prove that, I'm probably the only person in this room that didn't know TPAC and SAMR formula, but I know it now. I know the methodology now, so uh, the next time I present, hopefully I'll know that. So I wanted to talk about a little bit about IoT and education. So as I said, I'm not an educator. I'm not the expert on flat panel displays. This guy is. So I'm trying to carve out a little niche there. I know technology. I understand the technology that's coming down that's going to impact education in the future. And I understand what's happening in the Internet of Things, which is going to be very impactful for education. So quick show of hands before. Does anybody really know what IoT means? Or uh, other than as a tagline, do they really understand IoT? Or is this the first time they've heard it? OK, so in technology, we talk about Internet of Things all the time, so it's interesting. So the idea is, and by the way, thank you, Visonic, for this, because it says Industrial Internet of Things in the lesson plan. So I, st I stole their imagery for this slide here. What it is, is you know, if you saw me five years ago, because I presented this, we used to talk about all these devices are going to have intelligence. And years ago, we used to say, OK, they're going to be connected, they're going to be manageable, and they're going to be secure. And that's about it. We didn't really say why they need to do this. So we talked about PCs being connected to each other and the network, and that would help. But now what we're having is they're connected, they're smart, and they're autonomous, which means they're smart enough to, to actually make autonomous decisions on their own. They're smart enough to take the data in and make decisions. And the other thing, so that's kind of the preface for it. The question is, why is it happening now? And if you look at over the last few years, and this is the real killer, the cost of processing power, you know, the compute power, has gone down by 60 times. That's not 60%, that's 60x. And that's going to continue. Uh, to some extent, we argue that, you know, I'll be out of a job if it gets to this point, but compute power is going down to zero. So when you start to think of compute power as being very, very minimal cost, you can start to add it to every single device. And that's what's happening right now. The other thing is the cost of bandwidth. Um, that's gone down 40 times over the past 10 years. And then the cost of sensors has gone down two times. What's that add? That's adding intelligence to every single device that we have. I mean, you see it now. You have Fitbits. You've got your cell phone in your pocket. You've got your computer. Think of all your smart devices that are there. This is creating an avalanche of data right now. So by 2020, um, and people won't even understand this, but I'll, I'll give an example. By 2020, the IDC has estimated there's going to be 44 zettabytes of data each year. Does, it, does anybody know what a zettabyte is? I don't either. Um, by the way, I'm a recovering attorney, so I'm, I don't know how I'm a, a technical person here at technology. So um, a zettabyte, I, I'll, I'll give you an analogy. This makes sense to me. If you did a 16-bit 16 uh, 16 audio file of every spoken word of every human being who ever existed, that would be about 42 zettabytes of data. We're creating more than that every single year. By 2025, it's going to be over 165 zettabytes of data. Um, cars. Has anybody seen autonomous cars? You know, they're talking about self-driving vehicles. They average about four terabytes of data per hour that need to be computed to do that. So if you drive 10 hours a day, that's, you know, that's whatever, it's, it's 40 terabytes of data per day. It's an immense amount of data. The average person on a phone is about 1.5 gigabytes of data or so, 1.5 megabytes of data, 1.5 megabytes of data, excuse me. Suffice it to say, it's a whole lot of data, and with that data, you have to make real-time decisions. The other thing that this implies is once all this data starts to come, it can't all go to the cloud. It's, it, despite the fact that it's come down 40x, it's still incredibly expensive. Of this data, 99.9% .9 is going to have to be acted upon at the edge, and most of it's going to have to be thrown out, and only about one, you know, a half of 1% or a quarter of 1% is actually going to go to the cloud to, to make decisions. So it's not going to be cloud-based all. You're going to have to make real-time decisions at the edge. And that's something that you need to think about if you're like, um, from a classroom technology standpoint, from in a campus or school technology standpoint, you need to start internalizing what this means because you're going to need a strategy that's going to comprehend that. Um, one of the things that Craig will mention is that when you have a flat panel display, by the way, there's a pretty powerful computer on it. You can actually start to do a lot of this on something like that, not just use it as a, as a display vehicle. There's a whole heck of a lot more you can do with that. But I just wanted to impress upon you, that's what's coming, um, and it's not stopping. Um, my guess is, that will be well beyond, by 2020, it's next year, will be well beyond 44 zettabytes. And by 2025, it'll be well over 165 zettabytes. We've missed every other prediction we made. We're going to miss this one. It's a huge thing. It's literally, it's the industrial, you know, transformation. It's that big. This eye chart is, uh, we did some primary research um, from an education standpoint. We talked to universities, we talked to schools and said, what are the opportunities on a campus, a typical campus or a typical school from a compute standpoint? Um, I probably should have made this a build, but if you look at the first two 
you know, things there. Those are kind of the traditional compute things that we think of, maybe a PC or a laptop or a tablet in hand, even virtual reality. But the next ones, there's actually more. If you start to look at all this from projectors, from flat panel displays, um, student terminals, in-classroom digital signage, attendance, digital security surveillance, everything, there's IoT opportunities in every single level of a campus. And you have to start thinking about what this means to you from a technology standpoint. One of the things I want to echo um, what Dr. Parmar said before me is, don't chase, she said, don't chase technology. She said, you know, pedagogy first, technology second. Um, despite the fact that I'm a technology company, I'm going, to, I'm going to say that even more so. If you just throw technology at a problem, you're going to create more problems. You know, when you implement any of these technologies here, when you implement this type of technology here, absolutely, positively make sure you have a plan for it. Otherwise, you're going to have 10 new problems that you didn't have before. You've got to make sure you have a real plan, how you're going to use it to make sure. Um, I'll say this more when we get the flat panel displays, but you know, my wife who's been a teacher, she talked about it. She's like, well, you know, the first time we use one of these things, we just threw a few things up. It became the most expensive dust collector in the entire room. When they started to actually create material that used it and actually took advantage of the interactive capability of it and video capability of it, it became the most valuable device in the room and everyone was really engaged and it dramatically improved it. But when it was just occasional PowerPoint and, and they, heck, my, my wife said she used it when teachers, when parents came in. She put a PowerPoint presentation, otherwise that was it. You know, that was all. Now it's absolutely essential to what she does in classroom and what the school does where my children go. So just, I know this is a lot and if you want to see it later, but there's a lot to think about that's there. What I wanted to give you as an example, um, I spent a lot of time in China. Um, they've been doing a lot of education. They dedicate about 5% of their GDP to education and education technology is the biggest spender of that. And over the past five years, it's been really interesting. Actually about the last seven years, it's been really interesting to see the development. So they started with simple projector-based whiteboards and then went to interactive flat panel displays. Then they've done student terminals, broadcasting and recording. So what they're doing now um, and these are things that I wouldn't be surprised to see coming in the future. Some of these things will never happen. But each class, um, by 2022, is mandated they're going to have, it'll be recorded. So every class is going to be recorded. In every K through 12 school, it's going to be in the cloud. And I'm working with them now because they're requesting it. We're doing literally natural language, and we're using the flat panel display to do this, natural language um, interpretation. So the student, if they, it's a math class, and they want to look at the video, but they want to want to watch 45 minutes to find out where they are. They're going to go and be able to keyword index from natural language audio, which is say, I just want to go where they said quadratic equations. I want to say when they said triangles or isosceles triangles or something like that, and immediately record, fast forward to each of those things. That's the extent that they're pushing these things from an analytic standpoint. The other thing they're doing um, as we get here is camera-based analytics. This gets a little squeamish. Um, China's a little different. Um, it started with teachers, though. So they do analytics on the teachers. Um, this is the first mandate that it's teacher-based analytics. So they're doing analytics on the student, like how interactive. You know, they have analytics judgment. How interactive is the teacher? Is the teacher walking around a lot? What is he doing? Is he walking around the day? It's that type of stuff. But they're using analytics to help do some sort of a teacher metric. The other, but they're also even moving a little bit to student analytics as well, too. Primarily in the area of engagement. So they're trying to figure out, are students engaged? So this isn't like, oh, it's John, that's Sam, that's Bob, that's Tim. That's not what they're doing. What they're really focusing on is student engagement. They're trying to figure out, so we're literally working with them to figure out analytics of like, you can figure out engagement by if your head drops off like this or like this, or you put your head down like that, it's very clear that you're not engaged. So they're doing that. They're doing gaze estimation to figure out if the cameras are good enough to do gaze estimation. So the teacher at the end of the class can figure out and say, wow, these students were really engaged or they're not engaged. So they're sampling all of that right now and they're driving this on an everyday basis and it comes back. So we're driving all of this. What's interesting again though, is we're actually driving it off the compute that's in one of these flat panel displays. Um, and the other thing is as we go to virtual and augmented reality for teaching, which I think are both very useful devices for education. When you start to do that, when you start to examine all of this together, it's a pretty hefty workload from a technology standpoint. And that's where you start to need to think of an edge compute platform. Like how do I manage the compute power that in each of these areas? It's classroom primarily, but it's also outside the classroom. There's a lot of different uh, school management areas that you have to start to think about. So it's something to internalize. Um, I'm not saying I have a solution for you right now, but it's something to internalize to make sure you have a plan for it because it's coming and it's coming faster than you think. 
So anyways, I'm, I'm going over, I'm dangerously close to education right now, so I'm, I'm, my wife's caveat is in my ear here right now, but one of the things we're finding in, in education um, with students actually, you know, today, and we do this research primary for consumers of PCs and for everything, is that how do we make things interesting for people today? Um, you know, I'm 50, I'm, I'm old, I, then no one cares about me anymore, and what was interesting to me is not interesting, how I learned is not the way other people learn now. But how do we make things relevant, rigorous, and meaningful, both inside and outside the classroom? And one of the things I think, and this is where it goes into flat panel displays very keenly, is visual learning. Um, we do this actually from an advertisement standpoint as well. We do a lot of research on static imagery versus um, moving and immersive imagery. The reality is, it is, if you look at eye engagement for a static sign versus an immersive sign, it's night and day. It's off the charts difference. The same thing happens in a classroom environment. Our children live in a world of screens. We see it. I mean, everything they do, they're watching YouTube videos all the time. They're looking at their phone all the time. And then all of a sudden they do this. They're this world of screens and they walk into a classroom. It's like a walking into the 1800s or something like that. It's not engaging the students. You've got to really look at technology and take advantage of the technology. And that's one of the things that we absolutely have to do from a teaching standpoint going forward. And even as a non-educator, I think I can feel confident in saying that. Those are some of the statistics. We actually took these from a, more from an advertising digital signage standpoint, but it's very relevant from an education standpoint as well. Um, it's amazing how we're, humans are very, very, very visual driven. And if you don't take advantage of that visual driven and then supplement it with some interactivity, you're gonna start to losing, losing children. So with that, I'm gonna go a little bit into Craig's territory, and he's gonna go a lot more in depth. But I think really, truly one of the best tools, if you look at this, to put technology in the hands of a student to really make education rich and immersive and dynamic for students is to use a flat panel display. And I don't mean use it, by the way, as just a display mechanism. It's to actually make it critical to everything you do. I guess for, in this area, critical to your pedagogy, you have to do that interactive display to do that. And it takes really, if you look from the evolution of teaching, it takes the chalkboard, whiteboard, and digital projectors and takes it all and puts the best of it in the hands of, of one type of device. And that's the area. That's all I want to go into it because I'll let Craig go into it about what we can do with that. But it's an absolutely critical teaching methodology, I think. And my expectation is, I'm seeing this in the US now, I think you're going to see classrooms everywhere have this. Um, China right now has it and it's mandated to be in every classroom. That's a little bit ahead of the rest of the world, but we're seeing that happen even in India, even a lot of emerging markets. I think you're going to start to see this drive throughout the world and there's a huge opportunity for this. And it, for a very good reason, it works very well. Now I'm going to veer slightly into my advertising portion, so I apologize for this. This is like a 20 second commercial message. But when you're thinking of your technology strategy, just think about Intel. We're one of the few companies that covers everything from, we have all the CPUs, the graphic processor unit that you need, we power the cloud, but we also do from a, a visual processing, if you're ever doing analytics, even security analytics, we do all of that from a Movidius. We have FPGA technology from the Altera side, and we're doing research into every one of these areas, particularly security, privacy, and things like that. So we're kind of a one-stop shop, and there's really no one else from a technology standpoint out there that offers all of that together. Um, and we do it Intel, and we actually spend a lot of time researching. Education as a whole is a pretty significant business for Intel, so we do do a lot of primary research into it. <laughs>